Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, let me start by saying a very big thank you uh, to all of you uh, for staying behind uh, after a very hectic three days of packed information. Uh, staying behind to join us for the AUHF uh, is a st testament to your commitment to affordable housing. Uh, and uh, we're glad to have you here. Uh, just to start, we just uh, wanted to give a brief introduction about AUHF, who we are, what we do, uh, and then uh, hopefully those that are not members uh, will see the benefit in joining AUS as we all advocate and champion uh, the goal of affordable housing in Africa. So who are we at AUHF? Uh, uh, we are organizations uh, in different sectors of the economy that is geared towards mobilizing funds for shelter and housing. And we deliberately chose those two things. Shelter, it means it might not be too permanent, uh, but housing is much more permanent. So everybody within the value chain that is involved in mobilizing funds is can be a member of AUHF. And currently our members are uh, drawn from refinance companies across the continent, mortgage banks across the continent, uh, building societies, housing micro lenders, housing corporations, and then all the organizations that function uh, like Hunsby outside of Africa, you know, so they, they, they work in Africa, they work outside Africa. So I'll say we are almost a global organization based in Africa or based in South Africa. So that's where we are. Anybody within the value chain that is involved in housing can be a member of, of uh, AUHF. Essentially, we are committed to creating an environment or promoting working with government and the private sector to create an environment that makes housing work, housing finance work for everybody. It has to be effective and it has to be efficient so that there's access to adequate housing and affordable housing for everyone. Uh, as an organization, we meet every year for an annual conference. I'll, I'll get into that, but the picture you're looking at here is a conference, uh, the one before the last in Kigali. And the last one we had was in Cairo. Uh, we'll be going to Nair Namibia, uh, winter uh, at the end of this year. Uh, just a brief thing about our history. We were founded about 40 years ago uh, uh, with 11 members in seven countries. Uh, as of today, we have 69 members in 20 countries. You know, And our goal is to make sure that we have representation in every, every portion or every uh, part of Africa. Uh, and that's why sometimes even the choice of the location of our conferences uh, uh, is determined by how geographically diverse we want to be. Uh, as I said, uh, we have many countries, uh, 20 now, but we're hoping to grow into, we have a target, I wonder if we will that, uh, you know, and we're making good, good progress on that. Our goal is to have at least 100 members uh, in the next uh, four years uh, and we're on target with, with our strategy. What do we do? We do essentially three things uh, around our housing conference, which is this centerpiece. Uh, but for our members, we provide capacity building. We also do member showcasing. We promote our members on every platform on any uh, uh, event that we have. Our capacity building, sometimes we do it in collaboration with universities. Uh, we do some things with Cape University of Cape Town. Sometimes we do with organizations that are involved in just enhancing the capacity of uh, institutions and individuals to be better at housing finance. We're also big on lobbying and advocacy. Uh, you know, to uh, how do we get policies right in different countries? Uh, where we see that one country is doing something right, uh, we try and replicate or advocate for such in other places, so that there is a shared platform uh, for people to cross pollinate ideas and uh, do things better. So, lobbying and advocacy is a major thing. In fact, now we have written to the African Union, African Union, so that we can also be at the political level, not just uh, uh, doing things on our own. And uh, we are hoping that uh, that will come to fruition very soon. We're also big on investment support. Uh, we, are, we bring in uh, investors, uh, those who want, uh, who need funds and those who want to invest. We bring them together, we provide opportunities for partnership and cooperation. And 
We started that in Cairo. Uh, it was a very big success last year, and we're going to continue that. So there's an opportunity even for uh, cross-pollination of ideas, uh, and then even for uh, investors to meet potential investment opportunities and see how uh, they can make that effective. Our central activity for the year is always the housing conference. Uh, and as I said, this year's uh, conference will happen in, Nairo, in Namibia uh, on, on October 30th to November, 30th, November 2nd. Uh, that's when we bring in practitioners from every part uh, of the world and uh, for every discipline around finance and housing development, technologies and all of that, so that people can come together to, to learn from each other, to share ideas and to see how we can make housing really affordable uh, for everybody on the continent. At the end of every conference, we always have a declaration, which is a the mission, what we intend to do, uh, things that is passionate for, that we feel we are passionate about, and how we intend to drive those uh, agenda and make sure that it's realized. Uh, so every every event has uh, a declaration. The last one is the Cairo Declaration of 2022. Uh, we not only make the declaration, we also follow through to ensure that we have some form of implementation or impact uh, from those declarations. What's our board like? Uh, yesterday we had from May, May Hamid uh, Abdul Hamid. Uh, she's on our board. Uh, up until last year, she was a vice chairwoman, uh, and she gave us an extensive tour of Cairo and the new cities last uh, last year. We also have in the room uh, another of our directors, Sam, uh, who just won the. Innovation. Uh, I've forgotten what the award is, but I'm sure he has the check in his pocket. Uh, <laughs> and he will be our host in Namibia. Uh, we have Paul, uh, we have the CEO of KMRC. He was upstairs, but I'm sure he will join us here, uh, John Otiria. So we have a few people from different sectors of, of the industry, uh, just uh, so that even when we are making uh, <clears throat> deliberations on the board, we have a robust discussion and we have diversity of ideas. Uh, uh, to on, on how to move things forward. Uh, we have three essential committees, which I talked about. Uh, the first one is the Loving and Advocacy Committee, which is chaired by Paul Jackson. Uh, he's based in South Africa, and they have been doing some very interesting stuff, uh, a lot of securitization. Uh, they, are, they are focused on um, inner city re regeneration, and he's done an amazing thing with that, you know, so he brings that uh, on board, he gets uh, our lobbying and advocacy committee. Our membership services committee is headed by Samuel Akinin, uh, seated to my left. Uh, he's been an amazing uh, board member coming up with new ideas and new initiatives on how we can move the organization forward. I'm sure when we get to Namibia, we'll see a few things that they have been able to do, one of which is a technology and even how to uh, get access to people in the rural areas uh, to finance and all of that. Uh, and then the investment committee is headed by uh, Fundo Mabaso. Uh, he is with FNB in South Africa. Uh, uh, he, he, I wish he were here. He, he talks a lot. <laughs> She's laughing. <laughs> but uh, very, very, very good fellow. So we have a, a diverse board uh, that uh, run the affairs of, of this organization. And then our membership categories, uh, uh, we have so many categories because we want to bring in as many people as possible. And we uh, we are mindful of also the cost of running the organization. We are not profit making, but we're also not loss making. Uh, we have to break even on all of that. So the highest categories are the large financiers, uh, which are mostly financial institutions that pay about 2,500 and goes down uh, across the spectrum. Uh, the various services that are available also differs by your category, but as much as possible, uh, it is not a profit driven organization. We try to make sure that everything is available to as many people as possible. And uh, finally, on that last page is just uh, the logos of the various organizations that are members of the AUHF. Uh, as I said, there are 69 of them, and we are hoping that uh, the next time we meet, uh, every white dot here will be filled up with uh, new logos. 
Finally, uh, the pitch is, uh, won't be complete if we don't talk about uh, the amazing time we're going to have in Namibia, the ideas that we're going to uh, bring forth, you know, uh, the businesses that will be uh, consummated either in terms of uh, investments and um, uh, just funding and all of that. So we look forward to having as many of you as as possible in Namibia and as many of you uh, as members of the AUHF. Uh, we want to keep this short, but we are available to answer any questions or comments uh, that you may have. Thank you for your time. So what we wanted to do with, with all of you here is have a bit of a discussion about our Cairo Declaration, because it's such an important part of what the AUHF does, and we're learning how to use that strategically. Um, and I think that there are real opportunities for driving, for driving that work, um, perhaps a little bit more assertively. Um, and we'd like to do that with our members and with the wider community of people who are, are interested. Um, so what I thought we should do is just very quickly go through a couple of flashy photographs um, and then go around the room and have an introduction from all of you, maybe to respond to your thoughts on the Cairo Declaration and what that might be mean for your organization and for the mission of, of affordable housing. Before I do that, though, Please, can you say hello? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Casey. Uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tandi Wedlamini. I can imagine I've spoken to, I've had a chance to engage with most of everyone in the room, uh, but I am the AHF program manager, and I'm so delighted to have you around. And those that are not yet AHF members, we look forward to having you joining the community. And also, uh, probably through this, this, this particular discussion, we are going out with some action plan and some strategies that we're going to think about together and we work together and we coordinate and collaborate across Africa. Thank you. So the thing about having Anue as the program manager is she takes it very seriously to represent the interests of each and every member. Um, and so, which will be interesting to see as we grow how, how she will manage that. But really that's, it's, it's, uh, she puts all of her energy into it, and it really creates such a good grouping of, of, of practitioners who work together. This is, um, this is Cairo. We had a great time in Cairo last year, um, and the focus of the conference was on green, affordable housing. So we had sessions around green thinking. Um, so the theoretical frameworks, the issues that arise from that green Egypt, so experiences of how Egypt itself is achieving these issues, green building, green finance, green living. And, and within that space, what we try to do is to give our members as much opportunity to showcase their work within the context of our forum. Historically, we often had external speakers, but more and more, we're actually trying to emphasize our, our members so that they can showcase their work in terms in terms of this. The conference is open to not just the membership, of course, the whole the whole community. We hope everybody comes and that you all bring your friends. Um, we've spoken about the board. This is, I don't know if you've been to Egypt. It was just great. We had a really good time. And every year, wherever we are, we spend a day doing site visits. And that's where all the photographs on our website come from, because we take pictures of houses in all of those different places. Um, and we, this is a, the, the government housing scheme on the right. This is a picture from my hotel window. <laughs> so that's like Egypt as you find it. And then this is the public housing that that May spoke about yesterday, um, which is it's a it's a very impressive program, lots to be learned and, and studied there. Um, so our declaration, the, the reason why we do it, I mean, <laughs> declaring something is if, if you declare something collectively as an as, as a grouping, we like we agree on this. So this is we the members. Sounds a little bit like the constitution, right? Um, but it is a, a useful mechanism, I think, to bind all of us to a set of objectives, 
to be perfectly honest, it doesn't change much from one year to the next, except of the influence around the theme. I would love for it to change, but our, our problems don't change that much either. Um, and so within the declaration, we've got a section of we note. So we acknowledge the situation as it exists. And we appreciate that there's a whole lot that's under undergoing already that people are working on. And we, we want to connect with that. And then it carries on and it says we call on governments. And in this, we've listed five points that are particular to the to the context of the of, of the, the theme of the conference at the time. And these were drawn from people's comments that they made throughout the course of the conference. So we built this as, as the conference was underway. Then we call on international development finance institutions as well to do a whole range of things. Um, and there is to assert again, it's within the theme, but it's looking at, at all of the issues that are of particular importance to members. And then lastly, sorry, second last, we commit the AUHF as an organization to these six broad things. Um, and it's really about creating the space for everyone to talk together and engage. Um, and then lastly, we as individual organizations within the space of our own internal mandates as organizations commit to do these things. And we we draft this on the basis of comments received throughout the course of the conference, and then the AGM votes on it. And I think some people read it in detail. If we're lucky, some people just sort of skim the top and generally it's fine and they trust us and so on. I would really like to see that we take this as a proper call to action. Um, and I think that it, it resonates. So as a private sector grouping, it has to find some way, we each of us have to find some way of engaging with government. Government's pretty good with declarations, they declare, right? So trying to find a way to participate in the language of the state with something that a grouping of private sector institutions have put together and believe in is I think an interesting opportunity. And so every year now what we're starting to do is to collect data from each and every one of our members where they say, yeah, we did that and we did that and we did that. So we're producing now an annual report, which I mean, it's a bit overwhelming because we're also producing the yearbook at the same time, but a report about the members of the AUHF showing where they did something in support of these particular principles. And we want to get that rolling. So we haven't introduced ourselves why we're here or anything, but just as a, a really a, a context for the conversation to take a look or think about how in each, each of you are working somehow in Africa, how is this useful or not, or would you change it? Every year it responds to a theme, but is there a different way of, of asserting it? Um, happy to sign it and take it on, where else should it go? I think it's it's a seed that we're putting in and and what we're doing is 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 hoping that each and every member takes it and uses it for their own interest because it's common to everyone's interest. And it would be lovely just to have your thoughts um, about that. Also, I mean, you're you, you came to join and have a discussion about about Africa. So is, is this going in the direction that you're thinking of? Do you have other ideas? If we can just go around the room and can I start with you, Director <laughs> Sam Akinen, one of our members of our board. Yeah, I, I, my name is Sam Akinen. I'm the chair of the membership today. It has been a wonderful conference. Good turnout. I think we started with a few less people. And um, yeah, I, I, I look forward to having more ways to interact uh, internally with each other on how we're kind of committing to engaging with each other. Is this the, the declaration? We're going to write one in Namibia. And is that like even remotely a useful thing to do? Is it, how are you imagining using it? Or does it work without you? So that we 
present it and you can be happy to be associated with it. Yeah, I think I think it's a it's a phenomenal idea to understand the context and write something around how to implement make the stakeholders of the conference. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um thank you. Um I think um uh, it's great. I mean the conference has obviously been very useful. Um the conversations, uh, there are new vistas that we can uh, begin to look at when, when we leave here. Specifically concerning um, AU, AUHF and the declarations, you know, I, I thought uh, we're going to have an update of what has happened since the time when these declarations were made. This was November and now, that's like five, six months. Another conference is coming. So it will have been useful to see whether we've made progress in one or two specific areas with some members. Which uh, we should have, um, have shared uh, here today. Um, my immediate reaction is that when I see like eight items that appears too large a number for me, I always like when organizations just focus on two, three, no more than four. But reading through them, I think some of them are uh, interrelated. So it would be nice if, we, if you could just consolidate them into three, four specific plans of action that we can hand over to members and ask them to, uh, to build it on. You know. Um, I mean, so we'll, I'll also try to take part more in AHF, you know, typically I just see you guys as a, <laughs> as just sort of, I mean, I read your reports, I use all your reports, you know, that's, and if there's anything that um, uh, the center does, you know, the reports are very, very useful, very, very useful, you know, so I think we need to consolidate on that because Part of the challenge that we have in Africa is um, lack of access to credible data and information. So when you know that there's a place that you can go um, for open source um, invitation it's, uh, information, it's always very good. You know? So kudos on that. I think your point though is right, that um, it would be really good to hear from colleagues in the room, what have you been doing that is well reflected in these points. And please do introduce yourself. Right, great. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chumoke Akimumi. I'm co founder of uh, Alifia Capital. I would call it Africa's first impact investing entity. We have more than $200 million under management, none of it in real estate or affordable housing for that matter. Um, for a number of reasons. And this is what um, really made me start to speak to Keisha when I found out that there was this entity that had been established to try to do the right thing, uh, the principal things of gathering data and analyzing, evaluating, and making data available for inform informing our decision making in the, in the housing space. Um, this will be my first time coming out to any kind of meet with um, AUHF. I am completely impressed by the quality of the information. I digest every single thing that comes out because I do love data. Um, I looked at this and I thought this is a lot, but I think that what every, um, every organization that is interested and involved um, should do is take this um, and determine for themselves what their priorities are, order this, and actually rewrite it. And this is what we're going to do in Alithia, rewrite this, and then of course share it as well so that we all know what we can hold each other accountable uh, for. So that's the first thing. Second thing, yes, it will definitely be nice to be able to track uh, these commitments that we all make when we are all together um, somewhat. And I wonder if somewhere on the platform, we could create something that is possible for us to share our experiences as we go along uh, in the course of the year before the next meeting happens. One of the things that I think is really uh, vital, and I I'm not sure how we are involved with this is, and you know, we kind of think, oh, politics is so dirty. I've worked with government for a bit, and I, at least in Africa, and particularly in Nigeria, I recognize the weakness of government as an institution and the role that we have to play in the private sector to help the process along. I mean, there's a lot of expectations, you know, government doesn't do this, government is supposed to do that. 
it's not happening because truly the institutions and the capacities within many of our government organizations is rather limited. So we do have a very active role to play in uh, pushing through on our policies. And I think we all need to get a little bit more involved wherever we're sitting at to make sure that this happens. And this is one of the things that I've been like talking to myself about that can't shy away from really getting involved in pushing through on policies. And you know, this is this is a role that I think we all have to play if we're sitting, especially within Africa. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, uh... My name is Mohammed Mustafa Gambu, the head of uh, policy, research, and partnerships at Shelter Africa, uh, the Pan African Housing Finance Institution. Um, yeah, it's been a pleasure. Been uh, the three days, very hands on, practical. And um, at the closing session, kind of uh, uh, summarize all the talking points in terms of the way forward. Um, uh, relating to the Cairo Declaration, which uh, kind of focus on, on green green buildings uh, sustainability that that is kind of core to what shelter africa has committed as an institution uh, we do have a partnership with edge uh, in terms of enhancing and scaling up green buildings across africa and over the years we made a commitment that um, by the year 2027 uh, the majority of our portfolio will be green um what, what, one key area that I would really like um, the Cairo Declaration to focus, and uh, it's I'm, I'm glad we're even having this discussion within you know the context of the World Bank, the IFS, and other financial institutions, is that um, accessing green funding. Um, it's it, uh, it's 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 an area that we as 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 a DFI focus on both uh, the demand and supply sides. When we talk to developers after they have done lots of trainings, capacity building with IFC on green. But the developers, they kind of open up to us in that, okay, fine, we're all aware of the fact that it's good for us to go green for marketability purposes, you know, for our commitment to net zero. But then there has to be the financing green funding. It has to be made kind of much more practical, hands-on, more specifically looking at the developing world and African context. Um, and also small and medium-scale developers, they need to be capacitated. On, on how they can be able to access green funding. Um, um, I, I made similar uh, kind of comment at um, COP27, that Shamor Sheikh, then of course, um, there is need for us to go green and housing is a, is a key contributor, right? like 30, 35% to, to, to greenhouse uh, gas emission, but not, 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 you know, the most important thing that we need to do to let frog in terms of green buildings and more especially in the developing world and Africa context is accessibility to the green funding. Yeah, but we have to really, how can we be able to have bankable green projects or pipelines in the, in the market? So I think we need to really walk the talk and uh, AUHF, I believe we do have a role to play in that space um, because uh, coming, it has to be, because this declaration, I can see it really cuts across, you know, um, um, commitment, um, a, a, a leveraging and 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 efficient systems and so on, but the for green to really achieve the 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 objective is the supply side, yeah, delivering of the units. So I think the capacity needs to be there and accessing funding, concessional funding. That's one thing I believe will go a long way in enhancing adopting and adopting the green uh kind of principles going forward. Um, so that's one thing I really like, you know, that to to uh, to be ind indicated. And um, lastly, um, the theme of the 2023 conference in Namibia, in terms of focusing on successful case studies, that's that's my point also because I always say that we need to really have done lots of talking, you know, and uh, engagement. But what has worked and what hasn't worked? What are the lessons learned? How can we be able to really identify example of examples of successful case studies across African countries and also the developing world to really put in place measures to learn from successful measures and even failures? That's what we at our session on, on the first day saying that data, even a fail, failure is an example, it's, it's, it's a lesson. So I'm glad that is really coming into fruition. We shouldn't just be talking about, you know, the topics without really identifying what are the case studies, examples, hands-on practical 
so that those ideas can be shared within members and then we can replicate. I think that will go a long way in terms of, you know, Southside cooperation, understanding us. Of course, it's not one size fits all. And uh, within the IUHF context, Africa is uh, 54 countries, so different socioeconomic dynamics. But the thing is, once we are talking to each other, that will go a long way, enable us to share uh, examples of, uh, of, you know, successful. Exactly, exactly. So, 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 so I really want to, to really pitch, you know, to DFIs like us, IFC, World Bank, and yeah, so let's really, you know, talk to each other examples of case studies so that we can see how it can be replicated across yeah thank you um thanks Kesia. um my name is Mohib Muhammad. i am the director of business development and investor relations with real uh which is an um innovator and impact investor in climate smart affordable housing in africa and in asia um and so basically this is a kind of like um core to our vision, all the kind of things that are mentioned in, in this declaration um, are kind of like core to what, what we want to do and what we want to achieve. Um, and I think for me, um, obviously, this is kind of my first time engaging with the AUHF, HF, um, and it feels to me that obviously this is a kind of a very good framework to to give us like an, you know, uh, an overall um, roadmap to to do what we want to do um but my feeling is that um in terms of um how do we um hold ourselves to account and how do we, do we hold each other to account uh, that mutual accountability element is not it's is not what i'm really call, um you know clear on how do we do that within within this um uh framework uh, obviously, for us as an individual organization, it would be easier, kind of like, as I said, because it's our, it's core to our mission and so on. Uh, but that mutual accountability element uh, is what I'm not really sure about. Um, I think also the other reflection is that um, there needs to be a lot of advocacy and influencing. So we're kind of calling upon governments, we're calling upon uh, DFIs and other organizations. And so that that requires us all to um, work uh, with each other to also kind of like reach out to those organizations and influence um, uh, those policies and, and, and kind of approaches. So I think that is also something that I would like us to think about in terms of how we can, um, you know, work together to strengthen that element of advocacy and influencing. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, and thank you for um, enabling me to be here today. Um, I work for the National Council of State Housing Agencies, and we're an advocacy organization on behalf of the quasi-government agencies in the states that finance first-time homebuyers, um, homelessness programs, affordable rental to very low and low-income uh, individuals within the states. In listening to Keisha talk about um, and uh, if folks talk about what the African Union does, change the name, and that's what NCSHA does on behalf of our members. Um, so it's wonderful to hear how another uh, August, old like our organization is, um, advocates and works on behalf of its members. Um, we do a good amount. Our advocacy is not with Cong it's not just with Congress and the White House, but also with the regulatory bodies and those that help uh, facilitate the financing of all of the loans, whether it be HUD, uh, CFPB, the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau. So our advocacy is really at all levels. Um, we have our priorities. I think we have three, but they have like 10 subcategories. So, um, you know, we, our members dictate them just like, you know, you all do for um, the African Union. I, I will say that um, at the core of what our members do um, and our core membership are the, the HFAs are the public part, public private partnerships because they don't originate mortgage loans. They work with lenders to originate mortgage loans, um, whether it be on the single family or multifamily side. And, and so um, I, I'm here to learn. 
Um, I have, as I've come to this particular conference over, I think since the second one, I have learned that there is so much to learn from the different parts of the world and, and particularly all the energy and entrepreneurship in Africa. So with that, thank you. Great. Thanks. Uh, I'm Ian Shapiro. I'm the chief executive at Real. Um, and as Moahib said, I mean, in terms of the the core content of what's there, you know, strong, you know, strongly endorse. I guess uh, if we didn't, none of us would be in the room. So that's I'm kind of waiting for the the heretic to turn around and say they don't like it. I'm looking forward to that. Um, so, you know, I think that's great. I mean, in a previous life, I was an international diplomat. Uh, and I remember the uh, the joys and the horrors of kind of declarations. Um, you know, the horrors are, you know, all the months of preparations in advance, all your Sherpas back and forth, or you're trying to get everything signed off before anyone even meets each other. And then, of course, people meet each other. They want to then change. Your I mean, it's um, and then what happens with it? So I guess the question I think we're being asked by Tandue and you, Keisha, is, you know, how does this um, actually accelerate some action? How does it accelerate the utilization of each other? Um, that's my interpretation of the of the question. And so I think for me, what I've found works well, if you're going to declare, is to have a really fantastic framing and clarity of, of roles and responsibilities, which I think this does super well. I mean, we could all, you know, wordsmith it to death, but I think to to no value, I think it, it's great, it's solid. I think the question I would ask is, so what's the added value that this group's bringing in terms of actually trying to home in on, on changes of behavior? So who is the, the declaration? Who are we aiming at? And what do we want them to do differently? It seems to me that the benefit of this kind of collective is is looking for um, particularly changes in some government behavior and some of the in regulatory enabling environment. So I, I wonder whether the um, what we might dig into or what you're asking is to say, well, what are a, a couple of things that we would particularly value as a group that government to do next, not 15. And they, you know, my my top three may not make the list and that's that's fine because I think the the value is in the in the collective proposition, and I think then that's something that we want to then follow up on. So so what might those kind of things be that we wanted to push on? So you know how to ensure that the financing propositions that's happening in um, African markets is incentivizing green. I think you know others have already talked about that. You know what kind of structuring we expect to incentivize more marginalized communities to access end user financing. Um, how do we draw? I mean, it's all in that, but, but actually putting it into a, this community comes together and prioritizes A, B, and C. I, I'd see that as a lovely next iteration of, of what's there and then a value in a, in a declaration. Hi, I'm Debbie Erb. I just joined as an individual, so I'm not here representing DFC. DFC is, can't be a member, so DFC is not a member, <laughs> but Debbie is. <laughs> um, and so I would call myself a sustainable housing advocate, um, Sherpa, <laughs> I don't know what the right word is. Uh, and, and there are a number of things that I do as an individual beyond just my, you know, my day-to-day -day work. Uh, at DFC, because obviously, you know, DFI, there are things that it can do. And I think actually any of us that works for a major organization has the ability to demonstrate leadership, even though we're pretty constrained by, you know, the boundaries of our organizations. I do think as individuals, we can show leadership and, and we can speak to these principles. You know, I, I for example, I, I led basically with nobody telling telling me to do it, I just said everything that we do in the built environment in my team has to be edge certified, period. DFC has never said that, but we say it to the customers that we talk to. And so there, there are ways to individually make a difference. But some other things that I, we talked about way forward early in the conference and I'm very active in way forward. And I think that, specifically trying to target the work of the group to these initiatives is uh something we can definitely we can definitely do and i think some of it we're already doing 
Um, I'm involved in a group called the U.S. Acri Africa Collaborative. It's led by some professors at the University of Maryland and primarily with um, uh, KwaZulu Natal uh, University. Is that is that right? Um, in South Africa. So I, I think, and a lot of that is focused on education and bringing young people into the arena of affordable housing and green housing and cross fertilization of experiences uh, between South Africa and the US in, in this space. But I think there's tremendous opportunity to combine these platforms somehow beyond just that South Africa context. Um, what else? Oh, so I'm involved in an advisory group through GW. Uh, this is a guy who heads up a corporate responsibility advisory group there, professor. And we have a small group that's focused on ESG, implementing ESG with small companies in emerging markets. And again, you know, we're specifically thinking about ways we can, we can utilize our, everybody that's working in that group is, is a volunteer. Mm -hmm. um, and then the only other thing I'll say on the data subject, since I know it's near and dear to Casey's heart, I, I used to work for Mortgage Bankers Association. So I understand how trade associations work and lobbying was probably the number one agenda for, for MBA. Um, the second was, um, uh, what shall I say, education, capacity building and education, which I think is something else that I've been trying to do as an individual with AUHF, you know, with the investor investment committee work, you know, the, the pitch sessions, you know, those type, that kind of feedback to companies to help them prepare themselves to do business with people like DFI, groups like DFI. And then the third area was um, data. So collecting aggregated data on performance, even at the individual company level, so that we could create peer groups within the industry and understand the, how peer groups perform against one another. So it, it was all, it, yes, you have macro data about the market as a whole, but there's also a lot of information that companies can get to help them improve their own operations and understand better how to compete in the market. Um, again, prepare themselves for um, raising capital. So I, I think those are things that, you know, AHA, AUHF can definitely add value in a couple of the things that you've got listed here. Me personally, I'm working on it. And if I can drag DFC along, I will. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Eric Etchen. I'm the operations lead for a social enterprise called HLA International. And uh, our focus is taking a proven affordable housing solution and working to scale it in Africa using a franchise structure. So um, organizations like um, AUHF are critical in helping us in that regard. Um, and the way we like to think about it ourselves is we're not only building houses, we're building housing developers. And so that'll go to some of my comments. Things that um, I think in the, in the declaration that are particularly useful for people who are working on the delivery front um, that jumped out at me is the uh, item on developing interactive platforms and mechanisms to share support across the members. I think there's so much so many ideas and talent and lessons about how do you address challenges that exist, finding ways to quickly and easily share that and building even an even stronger community around that is significant. Also, um, the next one after that, building the capacity of the members through capacity building, sharing ideas about how do we exchange lessons and practices that build the capacity of, of people to deal with some of the most common challenges that we're all working on and sharing some of those. And the, for us, the power in that is hearing how it was actually applied in a real situation on the ground. I think that can make a big difference. Um, at this uh, third, uh, the one on engage and lobby African governments to adopt and implement recommendations. I mean, at this conference alone, just even this morning, there were so many examples about how slight changes in policy, central bank requirements, and so forth. So those all need to be done. And then the question is, what can we do? 
And I think one of the things that members of AUHF could do is tell stories about what would be the diff you know, what would be the result if we change things and if they were different so that policymakers can hear those examples. So there's the advocacy, which several people have talked about, but I think it's the stories. Um, and then related to that, um, uh, the, the one farther down is intentionally structure our projects and portfolios to quantify the social and environmental impacts. That's one of the things that we're working to do. Um, I think sharing lessons about how we are doing it and which data on our impacts is the most compelling because none of us have time to do it the way we'd really want as sufficiently. We all run out of time and resources to do that. So which elements are the most important when we're trying to tell the stories about our impact? And I think there's been many good examples at this conference, but if we could develop a way to kind of continue to share that more broadly. And then the last one, which I think goes to one of Keisha's, is collaborate to enhance data availability and market development. We've heard time and again at the conference about how making data more available um, and so forth is kind of shifting markets, creating lenders that are willing to lend to people with in, you know, incomes from the informal sector. So looking at, at creative ways to enhance data availability and creating an environment where people share that more readily. Um, I think AUHF's in a unique position to do that. What I would just offer, Keisha, is maybe in addition to the declaration, if there's ways to capture from members stories about how they've advanced any one of these and just share that on the website, in newsletters. I'm more inspired to do something when I hear something that a colleague has done and I thought we can do that and then challenge people to put it in their strategic plan or their operational plans. Moving from paper to action is our is our key challenge. Thank you. And real uh, kudos on the declaration. It's okay. Uh, my name is Patrick Masharia. I'm an economist working uh, with the Minister of uh, Finance, Kenya. I've joined the meeting as an individual because uh, the Minister of Finance cannot be a member of the Africa Union Housing. But I'm not conflicted. I'm in the right meeting. In the ministry, my role is very defined. I work very closely with the Kenya Mortgage Refinance Company to ensure that uh, the company is well funded to continue providing a cheap and accessible credit to Kenyans to acquire houses. And uh, since I'm on the demand side, I've been following the discussions to run on how the supply side actors can use innovative ways to continue providing and uh, uh, cheap uh, housing, cheap but quality housing units uh, in the country. And uh, I still uh, following the discussions. I'm learning a lot. This is, I think, my second. I was in Cairo. Yeah, I am, and I hope I'll be in Namibia just to learn more on these uh, housing aspects. Uh, and because uh, housing is a big, big issue, especially in Kenya. And uh, if you can uh, ensure the low income earners, we can convert uh, their, their rent to mortgages. That uh, would be a very uh, big uh, step. And uh, uh, affordable housing is uh, one of the big, big agenda in the government as uh, it was discussed by the cabinet sector in charge of housing. So thank you very much. I'm very new in this, but I'm learning a lot. Thank you. Hi, um, thanks. My name is Sandeep Singh. Uh, my colleague Michelle here and I, we represent uh, the EDGE Green Building Certification of IFC. Um, so, you know, first of all, I would like to say thanks to many of you. It's very heartening to know that um, so many of you have, are embracing EDGE and it is... Uh, you know, there's a there's a specific reason why a DFI like IFC uh, got into green building certification, and and I personally take pride in saying that uh, you know the the fundamental premise behind Edge is it's inclusive for everyone. You know, the the ba baselines are absolutely locally relevant, so that you know for those some of us may not be so well aware. So I would like to highlight that. Um, edge is, you know, is very, very metrics driven. 
tech enabled, it's on the cloud and it's always locally relevant, not just in the sense of the climate, the geography, but also in the socioeconomic aspects. And on top of that, because, you know, after all, we're all humans, right? So there might be some gaps. So we, we make it a point that we are adaptable. And if there are inputs from any of you about any of the gaps, we are always happy to adjust those baselines further. So, so that's, that's one thing that comes to mind. Um, the only other point I have here is, you know, I, I saw the mention of SDG 11, and I want to highlight that we have two other tools. Uh, one is Apex, uh, which is basically a planning tool for cities to, to reduce their carbon footprint and also plan the investments around that for the same. The other tool that we have is called Building Resilience Index, BRI, which is about buildings, but on the resilience side. How, and, and when it looks at resilience, it, it rates them, but not just on the operation, on the physical integrity, but also on the operational continuities side of it. So those are the two points. Michelle, would you like to add something? Yeah, so um, hi, nice to meet everyone. I'm a senior operations officer with the EDGE team at IFC. Um, and nice to see many of you again, Shelter Africa and Real and um, the different groups here. So I would say one of the things we would like to contribute in any way that we can. We have a couple of programs. This one's called DFG, Designing for Greater Efficiency. It's a free online sustainable training course. We've rolled out a couple of free trainings um, looking at women, um, different ways to get people to be edge experts. How can we increase the number of people in the field that are able to provide these services? So really in terms of our position in this advisory program sitting in IFC, we're here to help with these types of programs and we have active programs throughout Africa. Um, so just let us know what we can do, whether that's providing data, providing training resources. You know, our, our group is not the investment side, but we're here to help on any of the advisory or green building knowledge. So thank you. Of course. Thank you. Uh, I'm Olivier Asler. I'm a World Bank consultant for housing finance. And I would just have two suggestions for you. Maybe uh, uh, <clears throat> the first one is about uh, similar functions that the uh, edge is uh, fulfilling. I think that if on your platform there were um, a list of uh, accredited and recognized uh, certifiers, you know, organizations uh, which are credible and can certify that the underlying properties do meet. Uh, green standards that would be very important because greenwashing is really <laughs> it's an easy thing to do and uh, uh, for investors you know it would be important to have uh, uh, some kind of insurance that uh, the green uh, standards are actually met um, and the second thing that maybe uh, you could have um, a positive contribution is to have an assessment of the universe of uh, investors, uh, you know, to, to guide the, the lenders who uh, want to issue green bonds. Uh, how big is the, uh, uh, the capacity of a capital market of the bond market uh, to buy uh, such bonds? Is that uh, very tiny? Are there a lot of investors? Uh, if you could do a, a sample, maybe, or a survey, I think that that would be very, very useful. Um, yeah, good day. My name is Glenn Jordan, um, co-founder of Empire, um, a platform really designed to manage uh, informal incomes and enable funding to flow to um, for affordable housing to take that into account. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you to honor you for your work, Kisha, and, and the AUHF. The, I know sometimes it goes unsung, so in a public forum, sometimes it's nice to just say thank you for everything that you do. Um, because we, personally, I'm, I'm very grateful for that in terms of driving both the data and, and this agenda. Um, the only thing really that, uh, in terms of adding anything to, to this is, is really, I had, was asked to present at the European Foundation for Living, which is a European social housing forum. And I 
the funders were presenting there as well. There were some funding organizations and, and part of that was the, the discussion around the green agenda. And what fascinated me was that there was no onus on them at all for the funding, which I found from, a, from, a, from an environmental aspect, I found it absolutely astounding. Um, and, and so part of what, what, what's the question, just in terms of what we're saying, and obviously, as Ian said, there's no heretics here. We're all driving this agenda and driving it hard as, you know, just as, as human beings and as parents and as um, nature lovers. But, but part of it is, is who pays, because part the, the constraint that we constantly have is who are we competing against at this level for affordability? And that for me is just one of the biggest drives around that is, you know, constantly when we see the inflow of materials and where they're coming from and that kind of environmental impact of that, that's the challenge. And how do we structure that in a way that's practical, that that cost is not passed on to the end user and the end consumer for which they have absolutely, vast majority have, have really no inclination that the turn around it's our problem. It's your it's your first world problem. Don't bring my don't make your problems mine. Great. Thank you. Firstly, Keisha, congratulations to you, colleagues at Real and FSD for being able to push the the open data agenda uh, and to introduce it. It's 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 not an easy task. So so thank you for taking the lead in that um uh, one thing that really strikes me here uh, by the way i represent habitat for humanity uh, we are a member of the africa union for housing finance but would share my personal thoughts uh, on the subject i let my boss in the room uh, make a statement on habitat's behalf roland who you'll hear later uh, being in the sector long enough what i've realized is that housing is not a word or a vocabulary that really attracts attention. Uh, and if I want to make it very clear, it's not sexy enough for, for the big guys to look into it. And when it's not attractive enough, you don't really are able to see the kind of programming that really requires to really move the needle around it. Um, so I think while the problem exists, 1.6 billion number that we all refer to is like, almost a decade old number when McKenzie did its report, the 16 trillion number, and that was all pre-COVID. And that number did not capture the, the houses that currently exist. It's it's about the new houses that are required. So if I look about the, the markets of the retrofitting and the question that was put out this morning, are we talking about mortgages, about for new houses, or are we talking about home improvement? The market is good enough, the, the opportunity is good enough, but then why is it not, not being able to attract the interest that it is it does require? Uh, I hear more about climate and green versus hearing more about housing. Uh, I hear more about income generation versus hearing more about housing. I, recently, uh, the, the report that was launched around the gender inclusiveness and in housing decision was probably one of the few reports that we have seen besides the sum of the work that has happened in Africa through CAF and the work that Habitat has done. But in general, uh, housing is, is not a priority. Uh, I, and I think that is very clear. So while I appreciate the, the declaration that is out there, I, the, the question that I will leave for the group uh, to take into consideration is, what do we actually need to do to, to create a, a brand that really attracts attention? And if we do not do that, you cannot expect the money to flow in. But having the money available is also not the silver bullet to solve the problem because then you need the regulators, you need housing products to be offered, uh, you need people who are able to understand, sell those housing products, uh, MSME businesses and income generation that comes along with it, the developer financing and so on and so forth. I don't have an answer to it, but I do think that rebranding of the cause is probably the need of the hour. Uh, and I uh, and I, I look forward to working with you all to unpack this and how we all can contribute in our personal and professional capacities. Thank you. Yep. 
maybe I can speak on behalf of a yeah, couple of people here because we are represented the same team. This is Kudret. I'm um, in IFC, Financial Institutions Group. We are leading the housing finance team. Uh, a little bit the same, you know, overarching same group with uh, Edge and Sandeep and Michelle, but we are on the financial institution side, closer to investment, except Victor, who is also involved in advisory PPPs and uh, housing microfinance. Uh, we are a set of specialists based in different regions. Uh, so we benefited from the conference and your venue, of course, and uh, wanted to uh, say hello, greet and meet with all of you. The basic idea is probably twofold. One is Africa is, uh, for us, on the investment side, is one of the smallest investment portfolio that we have in housing. And it's uh, it's been changing, but it cannot still cover up the difference. Uh, we would like to work a little bit on the reasons. You know, we are all advocates of the same thing, so there is no need to uh, say the same things to each other, but uh, maybe it will be good to have your views on that. And secondly, is how to uh, cooperate more on our side. And now that you know us, uh, we know you, probably it would be nice to uh, continue the contribution. I think we already had the uh, Cairo conference. Was it last year? Last year, right? Um, pretty much it. Thank you. Please, yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Murwin Katuvesi Rawina. I'm at IFC working uh, with Kudre. We are in the same team. So I think he spoke on behalf of all of us. <laughs> so I don't really have much to say. But since the conference last year in Cairo, we've made a couple of strides in housing finance, specifically in South Africa, for working closely with financial institutions to green their developers' financing and also uh, scaling up green mortgages. We've worked with a couple of banks now and uh, we're seeing more green mortgages coming to market, specifically, specifically in South Africa because of uh, the load shedding challenge. <laughs> <laughs> so that has created like an opportunity for banks. So there's a lot of retrofits, refurbishment of buildings going in the market and that also have a great opportunity for banks to step back. What is it what we can do differently instead of doing the traditional mortgages? Can, can we can, can we look at our existing loan portfolios? Can we have like add-ons on those loans? So we we're working closely with them. We bringing in our edge colleagues that they can support that developer component. So, and we also have a partnership with IHS, which we all know, and all our investments in IHS is towards uh, green developments. And uh, I think uh, Kenya is where we're looking up to and doing a lot of work. We have, we having a lot of interactions with financial institutions and developers. And, and also I think the rent to own was a huge discussion during the conference. And also that's where IFC is really uh, looking at finding credible sponsor to partner with on RTOs. Thank you. Afternoon, everybody. Uh, <laughs> my name is Roland Pearson. I'm a vice president at Habitat for Humanity. And I execu I'm also executive director of the Twilliger Center for Innovation and Housing <laughs> in Shelter. Um, first of all, thanks to to the entire AUHF team for putting this together and all of its supporters. I think it's uh, you know critical a critical role that you play is bringing people together to share ideas, and that's exactly what we're doing. And I think um, you know I know my team and I have been sparked with lots of things that we're going to go away from this conference with. Uh, to carry forward. So, uh, you know, in some ways, just getting everyone together and talking has been very valuable. Um, the The mission of the, the center is to uh, accelerate and scale uh, solutions that, um, that uh, help to solve the affordable housing crisis globally. Um, and we focus on really kind of three verticals, finance, 
uh, construction decisions and processes and content um, and uh, and entrepreneurship and and uh, enterprise. Um, but I think probably the the and there is some relevance to to what the center does in terms of AUHF. But probably the larger relevance um, for us is through the bro broader Habitat for Humanity. Um, it's a nearly 50 year old organization. It has multiple representation in all 50 states in the US plus 70 countries. So it's an enormous footprint. Um, and one of the realizations that the organization had a few years ago was that as large it is, as it is, and, you know, for the literally tens of millions of people um, that it served over its life, um, if it it was actually going to meet its mission, which is quite literally to ensure that everyone has a decent place to live, um, that, um, you know, it was going to be sometime in the 2500s that uh, may maybe Habitat would partially get there. Um, and so <clears throat> there was a, there's been a, a bubbling up of, of a process of, okay, so how can we actually meet our mission? Um, and that's led the organization to uh, in the last few months, really codify um, uh, a strategic shift to something we call build and influence. Um, so the build part is pretty clear. Habitat is known for building houses, um, but you know, as I said, we we, we weren't we're not going to get to our mission by building houses on our own. <laughs> Excuse me. And so the influence piece is becoming much more important. Um, and so being parts of organizations like the AUHF um, is is critical. And I would say that, you know, we are in a position to partner uh, with AUHF and its constituent uh, members to um, help influence not just uh, governments, but also the private sector um, to, like I said, accelerate uh, housing solutions, affordable housing solutions at scale. So, um, you know, we're here as partners, as, as Ian said, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to say anything heretical about the, about the declaration. I think it's, you know, it's, it's fine. Um, I, I might suggest, however, that, um, you know, I think we all look at this, we go, okay, that was done six months or so ago. I don't think come October, we're going to think that those issues are any more or less important than they are now. And so, um, I wonder whether there's room for some consideration of whether the next conference skips a declaration and more looks at progress against the last one um, and tries to figure out, you know, where the uh, adjustments need to be made to to, to reaching that. Um, and I would say, complementing what a couple of folks said uh, have said about about the declaration. Um, you know, putting some metrics to it uh, might help to to sharpen the mind uh, about you know how what kind of progress we're making. Like I said, we read it. There's nothing particularly objectionable about it or or strange or out of place. Um, but I think you know until you start putting some numbers against it, um, some accountabilities against it, then we'll probably all come back and go, yeah, yeah, no, we're we're, that's a good thing. We should be doing more of that. Yeah, we're kind of doing a little of this and a little of that. Um, but I think, you know, like I said, and, until there's some more definitive targets uh, and someone monitoring those and serious discussions around how well we are or are not doing collectively to get there, um, then I think we, we, may, we may not be using our time most effectively coming up with another declaration uh, in a few months. So that would just be my contribution to the particular business before us. So thanks. Well, I am also part of uh, IFC, actually part of Kudret's team. So he spoke about us and uh, so about us, everything is, is clear. Uh, what I want to say that uh, actually it is surprising that we have comparatively small volumes in in Africa because Africa is the place where it is the most convenient for us to walk because of the center. Uh, I mean, because of the work that Kirsi and her team is doing in Africa, because nowhere in the world uh, you can get such 
opportunity to collect all the information and all the um, results, all the experiences of uh, what uh, conducted in, in many places. And in relation with uh, the declaration, I believe that most of the people are speaking here saying declaration is a nice thing, but let us do something practical. And most of the people here were speaking not about what to change in the declaration, how to amend it, but what practically to do to make it implemented. And so I believe that the, the major maybe part would be to start from collecting what is done in different places, uh, in different parts, at least in Africa, to, to share this and to somehow accumulate, combine and suggest to other places. And I know that uh, center is the best institution that can do it. I'm Bob Hornsby with Jobel Max. We're a home builder in West Africa. Once you make your way this far around the table, the risk is um, echo or provocation. And I'm not built for echo, but I'll I'll try to be nice. Um, uh, one of the things I'll mention is, is just how we have tried to work with past um, uh, declarations. So we, we had a, a fair amount of back and forth with uh, AUHF and within Guinea government ministries after the Kigali uh, uh, declaration and, and uh, targeting letters to ministers in, in Guinea and, and trying to um, get their interest in what was in that declaration. Um, those of you who follow Guinea politics, who I'm sure we all do, um, may know that there's been some shakeup in government uh, recently. So not um, n not all of the ministers that we delivered those letters to are still there. But I, I, I guess my comment on what AUHF and, and AUH members and allies might be able to do in terms of uh, getting the message of the declaration out is um, if you're trying to uh, use the the, lang the the concepts in these declarations to to affect change uh, in government ministries, um, if there's any kind of carrot that you can bring to the discussion, if you can if you can build partnerships with DFIs that that can that can give some parameters around, you know, if you can do A, B, and C, these are the kinds of things that uh, that that uh, DFIs or or, or 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 private financial institutions will step up to do. Um, that kind of thing tends to focus the mind when there's when there's funding involved. I could talk uh, a, a lot about some of the steps that we're taking uh, to put green building concepts into what we do. Just in, in the interest of brevity, I'll say that they um, th they are mostly centered around design that enables passive cooling, reducing the use of cement, uh, uh, or, and or replacing cement with materials that uh, either produce less carbon or sequester carbon. And, and we're doing some interesting things um, in, in all those areas that I'd like to talk about uh, who, with anybody that's interested. Um, and the last thing I'll say, and it's more of uh, a sort of uh, kind of connecting this World Bank conference with, um, with with some of what's come out of some of the AUHF conferences, is um, to to keep in mind the value of anecdote. And this is a little bit of echo because I think I think other folks around the table have have, have talked about the value of listening to individual stories, looking at case studies, the the risk. Um, of of having a lot of data, uh, and this is something Maria talked about up on stage at the at the closing session. She's terrified at the notion that AI will will go pull a bunch of data, bad data, out of the cloud and come up with uh, recommendations or, or 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 whatever it comes up with that um, that are exactly wrong because they have they have been built on on bad data and so i, I would argue that th w that that one of those early sessions that that was talking about sites and services and how the the bank has had this long arc of being big on sites and services deciding they didn't work and now thinking oh maybe maybe we were wrong that they didn't work well that's sort of that that's sort of uh 
failing and recovering slowly on 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 you know global financial institution timelines and of course what Mario is worried about, and and I think probably many of us are worried about, is is that AI just shrinks down uh, the pace at which you 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 make mistakes. Uh, it has the potential to do that, um, and uh, and so I would say that if if we uh, keep in mind anecdote at uh, at the company level and keep in mind anecdote at the country level, because if we have a if we have an Africa strategy for housing or an Africa strategy for housing finance, we don't have a strategy because it's too, the continent is too diverse geographically, in climate terms, in political terms, in regulatory terms, in cultural terms. There is no functional Africa strategy. And um, the more that we talk to each other about what works in our specific context, the better we'll get at understanding what translates, but not everything's going to translate. Um, and you don't know till you try. We've never had, as a company, we've never had the luxury of building things that people won't buy um, because nobody's guaranteeing us offtake. We've never had the luxury of selling and financing things when we can't sell that financing on because we've had to come up with the, the buyer financing. Um, so, uh, so we don't do, uh, you know, uh, we're, we we don't do everything uh, in, in, in perfectly, ideally, in terms of gr of green building. Um, we 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 sell, we build what we can sell, right? But um, but if we had the right um, partnerships, and, and and we're building those partnerships, we're we're Wolf uh, in, with Easy Housing, who's piloted his his concept in Ghana. We're talking to him now about implementing his framework to try to do some lower cost housing in Ghana than, than what we're initially going to market with there. So there's, there's opportunities for that kind of stuff. But, um, but I think we have to, at the risk of provoking um, the, the, the data enthusiasts in the house, I, I will say I am all for good data and all for everybody working together to, to collaborate, to, to make that data better. But if you think uh, we just cannot ignore the the fact that sometimes there are going to be uh, specific situations that don't match with the data. And then the answer shouldn't be, well, that's fine in practice, but what about theory? The, the, the answer should be, why does that work? And how can we learn from that? Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. My name is Roland Ibinoba. I work with Pison Housing Company. Uh, Pison Housing Company is a strategic development advisory firm. So we basically would work with um, developers, policy, governments, multilaterals, everybody in the value chain, um, looking at research, feasibility, and all of that. Now, my, I think the declaration is fine. I, I'm just going to bring really uh, my focus will be on tracking and monitoring really and i know that everyone has talked about that but i'll just give an example with trying to look at the declaration in number two which is adopting um, the use of innovative green building materials versus a recent study we just did with um, we did for afd which is on student housing now the developers that we were speaking with um, looking at the financial modeling and the business model for the transaction, we're not willing to um, take the cost of grain, you know, because that invariably takes up the cost for, you know, development and all of that. And so um, we, we finished that feasibility build the financial model, but there was, there was a component that was hanging where we were looking at, uh, would DFIs or multilaterals be ready to fund the initial capital outlay for the grain. Um, I don't know where that is today. I think I'll probably find out. So again, I'm trying to say that when we say adopt green buildings, you know, the practice of it really with the people who want to do it needs to be incentivized to make sure that that happens. So uh, that would just be, that would be my contribution really. I think majorly everyone has talked about um, what needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Asmina Banji. Can you hear me? Um, and I am the chair of the Kenya Green Building Society. 
I'm also a developer. I work for PDM Kenya, which is affiliated with the Aga Khan Development Network. And the AKDN mandates green building um, with edge certification for everything going forward, as well as retrofit so that we're on a roadmap to net zero by 2030. So I'm also an edge expert and I'm here in my capacity as the KGBS chair. Um, this is my first interaction with you guys. And uh, I read the uh, declaration this morning at 5 a.m. word for word. Uh, there's a lot of, um, it resonates a lot. Um, there's, there's a lot of alignment here because we do basically the same things, right? We're advocating, lobbying for change. We're doing capacity building, education and training. We've had a, a very strong partnership with IFC over the years where we're doing edge uh, assessments on buildings, as well as edge awareness training, edge expert training. Um, we also match make edge experts with um, developers and building owners that want to do certification. Um, so, but I would like to talk to Amit and Michelle because you, you mentioned gaps. And I think for Kenya specifically, um, there's a gap, um, which if adjusted could make it a whole lot easier for a whole lot of buildings to get um, green certification or ed certification. Um, we're also doing a lot of work with the, the county and national governments. Um, I'm personally reviewing the, the building code right now, um, not the 1963 one, but the, nine, the 2022 version that's being tabled in front of the government. Um, this is uh, through FSD Kenya to see if we can still slip in some green building requirements now, because um, as you heard at this conference, and I really liked what someone said about build better before, we can't wait till the next iteration of the building code to make sure that we have the green building requirements incorporated. So we need to do it now. It's an uphill battle because everyone else is saying, no, it needs to be voluntary. And in my opinion, if we leave it voluntary, it's not gonna work. So anyway, that's some of the work we're doing. We're also developing uh, green building guidelines with several of the Kenya counties, one of which is Nairobi City County. And I'm really happy to say that with the upcoming Africa Climate Summit, we've partnered with Nairobi City County to um, edge certify the governor's office. So we're just embarking on the assessment now and hopefully we'll get it to work. Uh, Kenya is also, <laughs> Kenya is also um, going to be, keep my fingers crossed, chair of the Africa Regional Network of Green Building Councils. And so part of our role with IFC is going to be capacity building with other green building councils across Africa. So again, hence my interest in the bigger picture and making sure that we're involved in greening affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for all of all of your inputs and, and, and the work in the months in between and the collaboration over the course of, of, of the year and also going forward. Um, I, I'm we're mindful of everybody's time and it's on a Friday and it's late. Um, if there is anything else that anybody wants to offer, very happy to hear that. But we'd love to keep in touch with you and find ways to connect. I've taken note of what you've said and we'll think about how to put it all together. Um, there have been some really, really good ideas. And I'm, um, Bob, just to say, we're, we're quite happy to be challenged and for, and disrupted a bit. It's, and really, we, I agree with you all. We've got a nice declaration. There's a lot of words there. So to figure out how we turn that into something real that we actually do day to day is, is, is a critical part of the process. Um,
Contact us, uh, even though we don't look. This sits because they they can't see you. The camera okay. is everything like this. So the, oh yeah, no, it's fine. Okay. It's okay. It's okay. The settings are set. For those people online, um, please do contact us if there's any issues that we've not discussed that you wanted to raise, and we'll take that forward. We've got lots of different ways of connecting and communicating with one another. I hope we see all of you in the media. Um, and towards that, uh, the thing about the African community for housing finance. It's a membership grouping. So we are responsive to your suggestions. So if you have particular suggestions for what you want to hear at the conference or what you want to say, tell us and we'll figure it out. We've got a very broad theme innovation as expressed through case studies. That's pretty wide. So please do make some recommendations. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Thanks.